I'm going to talk about the neurobiology of language a little bit, and we're going to dive deep into the brain looking at the white matter. But I try to link it back to TMS relevant uh, points. And you sometimes see a YouTube uh, logo on the slides. That means that for this particular topic, there's an entire dedicated talk on our YouTube channel. Now, when we talk about language in the brain, um, most textbooks suggest that there is a language network that looks a little bit like this. So we have Broca's area in the inferior frontal gyrus, Wernicke's area in the superior tem uh, posterior temple, and uh, some models even include the parietal lobe, but that one is a bit hit and miss. Um, and then these areas are connected by the arcuate fasciculus. Now the arcuate fasciculus has been subdivided into different segments, and we can argue over the name and the roles of these different segments over dinner. Um, but for argument's sake, this is the standard language network that we see in textbooks. Now, I would argue that the language network doesn't exist. And this has, as of 2024, become even more controversial uh, because there's been a series of papers publishing on the language network. Again, happy to discuss over dinner. Um, but the reason I believe it doesn't exist is because if we look at other functions in the brain, like the visual system or the perception action system, we can see that these systems are highly complex. So every box here is a part of the brain and every line is a connection between these cortical areas. Now, when we compare the visual system and our action system to the language, whoops, language system, then surely Language has to be a bit more complicated in the brain than that. <laughs> now, in comes tractography. So diffusion-weighted imaging-based tractography has done a great deal in mapping the language network in the brain, um, starting with replicating what we know from post-mortem um, anatomies from the 19th century, showing the arcuate fasciculus. Then in the early 2000s, the arcuate was divvied up into three segments, different names, different functions, not relevant for argument's sake right now, but just to show that we actually expanded and now the language network in terms of tractography also included the parietal lobe. Now since then, many more studies have mapped the anatomy using tractography, but then also many people in this room have actually mapped the function of these tracts by stimulating them uh, directly during surgery. So we have seen that over the years, or decades in that case, the language network has grown. So we're looking at much more than just the arcuate fasciculus. Now, also when we look at all these connections that you've seen on the right on the previous slide and look where they project to on the cortex, we can see that the language networks covers nearly the entire brain. And that is on the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere um, equally. So that means we're going far beyond classical Broca's and Wernicke's area on the cortical surface. Now, what you can also appreciate here with the colors is the inter-individual variability. And we're going to come back to that over and over throughout this talk because this is a very important point. Every brain is different. And most of you know that, but we can now slowly also appreciate that using neuroimaging methods. Now, this is an example from a book chapter that is coming out where we used language mapping using navigated TMS. And when uh, we do that, we need to consider that language is not just Broca's and Wernicke's area. So to give you an indication of the functions that have been mapped onto the various networks. Um, this is not a comprehensive overview, but just to make the point that we need to be aware what we're looking for and where we're looking for it in the brain. As I said, this is coming out and um, we also in the chapter give some overview and introduction how to combine TMS with tractography, the different approaches um, you can use for it. Now, tractography. It's a beautiful method, <laughs> no question about it. When we peel away the cortex, we can see all the connections in the human brain. Now, there's many different names you can give to that. It's called a tractotrome, connectome, 
it doesn't really matter. The point here is that you can see that everything is connected to at least something, if not everything else. And that can either be directly or indirectly. Now, how do we get those beautiful images and what are essential takeaway points for you to consider? So in general, if you're interested in the story of the brain connectivity over the past two decades, there's two special issues in science that cover the 20 years with tractography that we just had, and you're welcome to have a look. Um, but a couple of points that I want to make today. Uh, the first one is tractography is more than DTI. Now, I know most scanners just say DTI sequence, but I'm going to show you why if you call your sequence DTI, you actually, most of you, I would assume, underestimate what you have. And that is because DTI is the first ever algorithm that we had. It's based on the FACT algorithm. And for every voxel in the brain, it can only give you one fiber orientation. Now, what that means is that when you look at a map of the brain, you end up with this smarty image right here, where for every little voxel in the brain, there's only one in orientation in the brain. Now, anatomically speaking, what that means, if we hit a voxel where we have crossing fibers, which is the majority of the brain, the algorithm has to make a choice. And there's usually three choices it can take. First one, it hits that point, doesn't know where to go, and it stops. That's a false negative. So you're not going anywhere at the point of crossing. The other possibility is you hit that voxel and it takes the average, goes in the middle. So that's a false negative because you're going somewhere we shouldn't be going. And the other point uh, that you see here that can happen is that it takes the preferred orientation of the stronger pathway. So in that case, it's the cortical spinal tract and the corpus callosum. We know the corpus callosum is radiating towards the lateral surface of the brain, but we cannot see it with a classical DTI acquisition. Now, if you change your algorithm to advanced tractography models, and there's many of them about, uh, I'm just showing spherical the convolution here, you can see that we can now resolve some of the crossing and actually reconstruct the lateral projections of the corpus callosum. So knowing your algorithm is important when you want to relate it back to the anatomy of the brain. Now, this is obviously just deterministic tractography. We also have probabilistic tractography, um, where the idea is quite different. So instead of having a whole brain tractogram where you dissect out the areas you're interested in, you place a seed region and propagate from that to a target or to the uh, rest of the brain, and you get a map of reproducibility. So how often do you replicate going from A to B if you've repeated a thousand times? Now, they both uh, have their advantages and disadvantages, and it very much depends on the question that we're asking, which algorithm should be the preferred choice. Now, bring it back to language in the brain and also why that actually matters for many of you in the room, is that if we look at the language network using DTI, we can see that the arcuate fasciculus doesn't even reach classical Broca's area. If we use fericative convolution, then the arcuate even overshoots what we consider classical Broca's area. Same for the temporal connections. Now, for the cortical spinal tract, it's the same story. So a classical DTI analysis will only show you the most central part of the tract and not show you the lateral projections. Now, this is particularly important when you then look at the distance to a lesion in the brain because changing the algorithm changes how far away the lesion is from a tract. Okay. So the problem that we fundamentally have here is that we don't actually know the ground truth. Sounds silly in 2024, but we don't actually know what the white matter of the human brain should look like because all the methods that we have available in the human brain don't tell us where in the cortex we're going. Because there's only one method, it's post-mortem, Klingler dissection, and you carve away the cortex. So we can only 
guesstimate where the white matter terminates, but we can't be sure using methods to visualize them. And the same holds true for tractography, which is a bit iffy the closer we get to the cortex. Now, the other point I want to make is that, even myself, I'm guilty of it, I noticed it in the first <laughs> slides, uh, is that we call the white matter that we see fibers. Now, technically speaking, they're streamlines. They're streamline reconstructions even. They're not fibers. And the point is that the way we get those beautiful images is indirect. So what you see here is a road around London. That's why the cars are swapped. Um, and we're interested in knowing what the road looks like and where the road is going. But we don't see the road. Yet you all have a fairly good idea of where the journey is going because you estimate it based on the lights of the cars. So you take that information of the lights and you piece it together and you assume that if the cars are going that way, then they better be driving on a road. Now, if we turn on the light, you can see there is a road. That's the fundamental principle of diffusion-weighted tractography. We're not looking at the accents, we're looking at the diffusivity of water molecules, and we assume that if they go in that direction, there better be an axon that helps them go that way. But we don't actually see the axon structure itself. So that's why we shouldn't talk about fibers, but about streamlines. Okay, now, uh, I borrowed this. Some of you may have taken the tube uh, in Berlin. So you have seen the map up here, which is just a map of the Berlin tube. And the Guardian, a couple of years ago, took uh, various tube maps around the world and reshaped them, given the geography of a city. Now, we can do exactly the same exercise, and we just change the metro for white matter and the geography for anatomy, and then do the same thing in the brain. So here is two studies that were published in Science uh, a while ago now, where the first model said that all the white matter is orthogonal to each other, so everything is 90 degrees. Now, if you change the way you look at the white matter, then you can see that, in fact, it's not all 90 degree crossings, but you have smooth transitions between the tracts. Now, Another important, sorry, Francesca. <laughs> Another important point about tractography is it matters what we want to know. So this was my journey yesterday from Nijmegen in the Netherlands to Berlin. I had to be here on time for dinner. Um, so what did I do? The thing we all do, I pulled out my phone, put it into Google Maps. I'm like, take me from the Netherlands to Berlin. Now, in the first instance, I was only interested in the highway. Take me there, the fastest possible route. I'm hungry, right? <laughs> Once I got here, I was like, okay, now I checked in. How do I find the restaurant? So now I needed a map that is slightly more detailed. And then this morning, I was in a hurry, so I was like, now I need to know exactly where I need to go to get here to be on time. Now, the same applies to tractography only that the images look different. So depending on the question that we're asking, we have to zoom in or zoom out of our brain maps to see the level of detail that we need to see. And I'm quite excited to say that Nijmegen is getting a 14 Tesla scanner. So we're going to, I know, it's insane. Um, <laughs> but uh, what that means is that we're going to see anatomy in a way that we have never seen it before. Now, for diffusion, that's going to be close to pointless because we don't need more Tesla, we need more gradients. Um, but for proper anatomical studies, that's going to be quite exciting to see if we figure out how to analyze the images. Um, now, if you're interested in how to optimize your tractography sequences, we wrote a chapter um, where we detail what is feasible in a clinical scanner and what you can tweak to optimize it if possible. And the rest of the time, I want to move away from the method and show you how we apply it. So, uh, quick shout out. Anyone recognizes these women? I hear whispers, but I can't hear. 
Nobel Prize winners, correct. In fact, it's all the women who ever won the Nobel Prize for physiology and medicine. And I asked my student to come up with an average image so we know what we need to look like as a woman to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and here you go. Ta -da. That's what you need to look like. Now, a couple of points here. Number one is the algorithm worked. We have a face. Good start. Number two is the face in the somewhat middle of the slide doesn't actually look like any of the individual faces around it, nor do any of the individual faces around it look like the image in the middle. Okay. So the point here is that by averaging, we get information, but we also lose information. Now, the most important uh, takeaway point for me here was that it doesn't work looking the way the average face looks, and it also doesn't look anything like me. But if you want to make it into the average image, look at this. You've got to wear leopard print. <laughs> there you go. I was hoping to update this image uh, for today, but sadly not this year. I know, right? I was wondering if she's driving the average, but <laughs> um, right. Now, this is obviously a toy example, um, and that is because it's very easy to understand the point that I'm trying to make, because if I show you the average brain, it's a lot harder to see the same problem. But what we see here is that some structures of the brain they have really sharp boundaries. So here we're in the uh, basal ganglia, and where we have sharp boundaries, we have less variability. Other parts of the brain are very blurry, and that's where we have a lot more variability between us. Now, this is the average, but I'm sure doing TMS, you've all come across the motor cortex and how variable it can be. We have the same for the language network. So if I just point <coughs> your attention to the uncinate fasciculus here, it's barely visible in this healthy participant, and it's extremely prominent in this healthy participant. They're randomly drawn, so this is really just to show you the magnitude of variability that we're dealing with. Now, these are hand-picked examples, obviously, but we looked at it on uh, a group-level analysis, and what we could see is that A, variability is not homogeneous across the brain, it varies, and B, it varies in a consistent manner whereby deeper structures tend to be less variable, and as we move <coughs> further out, we become more variable. Now, this in itself is quite an interesting finding, and it also has ramifications. So if we rely on atlas-based approaches, for example, then if we're interested in the deep structures of the brain, an atlas is fine, because we tend to be more alike. But if we are interested in more lateral parts of the brain, then an atlas is probably not the way to go. And to give you a clinical example, this is a brain tumor patient that we had access to, and we mapped the cortical spinal tract here in blue in both hemispheres. In green, you see the tumor. And we used uh, an atlas to inform us where the cortical spinal tract is, and that's outlined in red here. So if we had relied on the atlas, we would have completely missed the individual cortical spinal tract in that patient. So be careful when using atlas-based uh, approaches. Oui, that got messed up in the conversion. Um, but the point here is there is many white matter atlases out there. Now, they all have advantages and disadvantages. Um, what you can see is that most of them are based on the fact algorithm, and most of them have less than 60 tracts. Now, the reason this is important is because if we zoom in in the two coming from our lab, so I'm allowed to critique ourselves, um, we can see that this is an atlas that was based on classical DTI tractography, so the tensor model. And what you can see is that most of the brain is not actually mapped. Most of the brain doesn't show you the track using DTI. Now, we updated that a couple of years later using advanced tractography, and now you can see that a much larger part of the brain has been mapped in terms of the white matter anatomy. And we're currently working on a new atlas that has 120 anatomically validated white matter pathways. So that is hopefully coming out soon. Okay, now, so we know we're different. The question is, does it matter? 
right? So uh, we set out to do a study uh, reviewing the literature on the variability of anatomy and the variability of cognitive profiles. And what we found is that, yes, it does matter. And also most of what we know about the function of the white matter, we actually know from clinical patients. So the majority, 45%, neurology and neurosurgery, sorry, lumped you together, 29% um, from psychiatry, and only 25% of the studies were done in healthy controls. And obviously, when we look at the tracts, then cortical spine tract is a superstar in the field. And as you go down the list, if you're looking for a topic of study, look at this end. <laughs> There's room for improvement. Now, uh, this is the variability in anatomy, but we were interested in the variability related to cognitive functions. And if I zoom in into my favorite network, the arcuate fasciculus, classically known as a language pathway, but in fact, if we look at all the correlations in the literature, it's not a language pathway. It's primarily involved in language, but it also um, loads on various other cognitive and behavioral measurements. So the point here is that there is no one tract, one function association. The tracts get dynamically recruited based on what they're needed for. Now, that anatomical variability is also related to clinical recovery. So the, the review was done in healthy controls. Here's a study in stroke patients from the acute to the chronic stage where we followed them up six months after. And I highlighted three patients for you. Patient one is here. The language recovery in this man was not great six months after symptom onset. And when we look at his arcuate fasciculus in the healthy right hemisphere, we can see that it's quite a thin connection. Now, our second patient here did slightly better in terms of language recovery, and her arcuate was already stronger in the right. Patient number three is in the blue box, so that is, according to the Western aphasia battery, fully back to normal language function, and that person has a really thick, strong connection in the right hemisphere. Now, what's interesting about this data is that it's controlled for clinical and demographic uh, variability, which together would have predicted somewhere between 30 to 40% of the recovery. And by adding the variability in the arcuate fasciculus, just the arcuate fasciculus, you can nearly double that predictive power of recovery. What's even more exciting is that we have used these maps to create what is known as a morphospace, whoops, sorry, and map all the possible disconnections you can have based on a lesion in the brain, and then associated that with one year recovery across 87 cognitive and behavioral scores. And this is a website that you can uh, log on to right here. And all you need is a mask of the lesion. You upload it and it calculates the disconnections for you and the predictions of recovery one year after symptom onset. Now, this was obviously developed for stroke, but we're currently in the process of uh, developing or expanding this uh, method to um, brain tumors as well. Now, to sum up, um, we've come a long way when it comes to the neurobiology of language. We started with a very modular view of the brain with Broca's, Wernicke's, and Geschwind's area. We have then seen that tractography brought in a more hierarchical <coughs> model, the arcuate fasciculus, information traveling from A to B. But what the collective evidence of the studies currently suggests more likely is that we're actually looking at an integrative model where language emerges through the interaction of various parts of the brain, not just Broca's and Wernicke's area. And the way I like to think about it is like an orchestra. So if you ask me where language is in the brain, I can't really point to a single region in the brain or a single white matter tract. And it's akin to asking an orchestra where their music is. It's not an individual instrument. It's not an individual musician, the conductor. It's in all of them coming together in a timely manner that music emerges. And that's how I believe language works in the brain. And with that, thank you.